One of the major threats to peace and security in Africa is the growth of terrorism. Terror-fueled violence has killed and wounded thousands, resulting in the destruction of human and physical capital. Terrorist groups, however, specifically target women through gender-based violence or using them as a means of achieving ideological aims. Hello everyone, welcome to Our Voices. I'm Simeon Shekoye and I'm joined by my co-hosts Orian Itangishaka and Amina Aliyu. Today, we'll take a deeper look into the role of women in counter-terrorism activities and why it's important to support them. Ladies, many analysts argue that even though women are the main targets, they are often uh, pushed to the periphery when it comes to counter-terrorism efforts. What's your take on that, Orian? Well, I don't think that they are being put on the periphery of these efforts. However, I think that they're not being highlighted for what they're doing, especially on a global scene. We don't see a lot of African women who have, you know, done so much when they have done so much because, you know, it's, it's the hot spot for civil wars and so forth. Um, I think that in places like in Burundi, women were so involved in peace negotiation, in the Arusha Accords, in many peace efforts, um, that you didn't really see them in prime TV, in prime time, when it was time for coverage of what was happening to bring the peace um, in the country. Um, you just read them maybe in books, uh, you read them in documentaries. So I think that they need to be highlighted more for their efforts. Um, they do the, the, the negotiation parts, but they do also um, grassroots efforts like, you know, organizing, exactly. you know, little things that bring the communities together. And we have seen that yeah. in Nigeria. Yeah, definitely. Orian's mm -hmm. point about grassroots just brought something back to my mind. Mm -hmm. So I think with regards to conflict and terrorism, it depends on the region and what exactly is going on, the type of conflict that's going on right there. Because to me, in Nigeria, it's really common in the South South to just walk past and see an unconventional security woman mm. armed mm -hmm. providing security for that region. Yeah. So I would say that they're very active and they're very present and on um, the ground. So especially. much so that you don't even pay attention to whether That's it's a man great. or woman. Yeah. yeah, I think you both make up, raised a good point that women are mm. often um, on the front line organizing themselves to protect their communities, mm. providing aid, or you know pushing for peace, but mm -hmm. their, either their effort is less recognized mm -hmm. or as you go up in the ladder, their voices are less and less. Mm -hmm. According to the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, Sub-Saharan Africa recorded the, high, the largest increase in terrorism deaths this year, and 60% of all terrorism deaths globally occurred in the region. Women are often major targets and victims of terrorists non-state armed groups or criminal networks. Sometimes women are even recruits. Yet, most counter-terrorism activities overlook the roles women play in violent extremism. As terrorism and extreme, uh, extremism continues to take a heavy toll on communities in Africa, countering and preventing heinous acts on the continent often requires active participation and strong, strong leadership of women. On this week's episode of Our Voices, we will explore women's ongoing anti-terrorism activities on the continent. We will also discuss the importance of supporting women and girls to prevent radicalization and share expert views on how to ensure women's voices are represented in national and regional policies to counter extremism. Well, let's first go to West Africa and take a look at how women are helping to counter violent extremism as the United Nations calls for more participation of women globally in places and, and peace and security efforts. West African women are playing a more prominent role in the region's military efforts to stop extremism. U.S.-led training is helping to bring more women to the front lines to, um, to win the hearts and the minds of terrorists in hotspots. Henry, Henry Wickens reports. Earlier in May, female soldiers of the Ghanaian Armed Forces underwent debriefing, recapping what they learned about women, peace and security at US-run flintlock exercise in March. Lieutenant Colonel Jacqueline Garli says the training helped her prepare for and understand why it's essential to have women on the front lines when countering terrorism. I think that having women as a peace builders on the team will help to curb the situation. Um, in the form of providing some form of relief for uh, victims of violence, especially sexual violence, because most of these acts are perpetrated by, by males. And so they will be more comfortable to talk about uh, those issues 
to their females. According to the United States Institute of Peace, Women, Peace and Security is a policy framework that recognises that women must be critical actors in all efforts to achieve sustainable international peace and security. This can extend all the way from women accompanying male soldiers on outreach missions to terrorist-controlled villages to negotiating peace settlements at the highest levels of government. Flintlock, a US-led exercise held annually since 2005 to train security partners in West Africa, was held in Ghana and Ivory Coast this year. Both countries are grappling with terrorist incursions on their northern borders. For the first time, the exercise has made women, peace and security a central part of the event. Faye Kuvis is Deputy Chief of Staff for the US Special Operations Command Africa, SOCAF, which organised Flintlock. She says West African militaries had almost no capacity for women peacekeepers working on the ground before the training was introduced. It is to work with our partners to build their civil military capacity, but from a female forward perspective. Um, in the U.S. Uh, and coalition partners during Iraq and Afghanistan, we called that we called those teams female engagement teams or cultural support teams. Uh, so this is very much taking that same template. Um, but implementing it with partners. For example, in West Africa, cultural constraints around social interactions between men and women mean it is easier for female soldiers to win female hearts and minds in communities affected by terrorism. The UN is also making a push to involve more women in peace building and conflict prevention. As for Gali, she says she is excited about playing a frontline role in Ghana's anti-terror efforts. If you're a woman, accept challenges. And like the oath we took um, before office, you go wherever ordered by land, sea and air, even at the peril of your life. As the global push for women to play a more active role in peace building and counter-terrorism continues, many more will likely follow in her footsteps. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Accra, Ghana. Thank you, Henry, for that report. To further discuss United States' commitment to include women in terrorism prevention efforts, we are joined by U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs, Chidi Blyden. American with roots in Sierra Leone, Ms. Blyden was the first Africa director at the Center for Civilians in Conflict, where she led uh, the design and implementation of culture-specific training for the Nigerian Armed Forces on civilian harm. She also recently served in Congress on the House Armed Service Committee policy team, advising on Africa and South America's defense equalities. Ms. Blyden also is an adjacent professor at Georgetown University in the Security Studies program. Deputy Assistant Secretary Blyden, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Ms. Blyden, United States works with many African nations to build their capacity so that they can be able to uh, detect, uh, prevent, or respond to terrorism activities. But how much um, does these partnerships include women, especially women and girls, who are on the ground affected directly by uh, terrorism activities? Well, as you've noted, the United States does uh, make a very concerted effort to work with all of our partners around the world uh, to ensure that we are being very gender diverse, but also including women in specific efforts that address security threats on the continent, but as I said, globally. Mm -hmm. I think what you've noted um, is something that we're very proud of, um, and that is that women, peace, and security is a core part of our security policies in the United States. And as we share our human rights values and, and other values that we have on security threats around the world, World. This is a, a core part of it as well. We're the only nation that has a WPS le legislation, what we call Women, Peace and Security for short. And that means that in everything that we do from a policy perspective, we include women, peace and security at the highest levels of our government and across all agencies to include the Department of Defense. Part of that means that when we do our training, while we do other value sharing as well, mm -hmm. we ensure that women are included. And this is something that we've found our partners have been extremely receptive to because because they understand that the perspective of including all communities, whether they are marginalized or small communities, but especially women, is critical uh, to the problem solving that takes place. Mm. Now, we know that women also can be part of the problem. Um, uh, they can be 
not only victims but also perpetrators mm -hmm. of um, extremist uh, radicalization. Now, um, either sometimes by choice or by force, yes, but um, what are some of the efforts you think are either through, um, uh, uh, through agencies like AFRICOM or maybe the African Union that you might be working with, uh, the United States might be working with, to try to um, address that uh, particular issue so that women aren't radicalized? Sure. I think what we've noticed is that, like many other communities, um, women are not uh, the only ones who are not vulnerable to being uh, susceptible to becoming perpetrators of violence. Uh, while violent extremism has taken a particular toll on the continent, um, it's not the only security threat. And like any other marginalized community, whether it be women, children, youth, um, we address these things in the same ways that we do um, with women. Mm -hmm. And that is making sure that they're informed, making sure that they understand the challenges and what could be some of the repercussions of, of being a part of these um, organizations. But I think for us, we look even deeper beyond that and we look at some of the roots of insecurity and some of the drivers um, that are causing women and other vulnerable, uh, vulnerable groups to join um, these types of organizations. And once you start to look at that, you see the problem is, I think, much bigger than just security. You're looking mm -hmm. at grievances, you're looking at basic human needs not being mm -hmm. met. And for that, we make it sure that we are trying to employ what we consider to be a three D approach, at least at the um, Africa Command, and then also a um, whole of government approach. It's never one-sided that defense or security was the only issue that I think has driven people to violence or insecurity. Mm -hmm. You're looking at economic situations. You're looking at uh, the need for, as I said, basic human needs. Mm -hmm. And so as we look at um, trying to curb this recruitment and process, we, we are having to that. focus on some of those uh, drivers as well. So last week, uh, you met with the Nigerian chief of defense. Um, and other Nigerian military officials discuss collaborations as to counter violent extremism, um, especially in the Sahel. So how much does the U.S. support local women organizations in countries like Burkina Faso, like Mali and Niger, who are quite close to Nigeria, um, to limit extremist groups' local impact? How was that conversation? You know, we had um, a, a big celebration last week where we met with many of our partners from across the world at our state partnership program. And our state partnership program is helps to bring uh, a particular type of training in humanitarian assistance and civil uh, military assistance. So I had an opportunity to meet with all of my partners, Nigeria, Niger, Mali. We have 16 partner programs across the, um, the African continent. But you like the Nigerian the most, though. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time working on uh, Nigeria issues, so it is, it is a near and dear to me as well. But I think what we did cover in our conversations was that um, there is a need for us to be able to provide more insight into the challenges and the opportunities for women to be involved in some of these um, efforts. As you saw from the, the video or from the clip, you know, the Special Operations Forces Africa that works through our Combatant Command AFRICOM makes a concerted effort to try and target some of these communities so that they understand information sharing, the role that civil society plays, the role that um, uh, women can play in the community, and that's partnered with our partnership with the uh, United States Agency for International Development. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of work on governance. They do a lot of work on developing the capabilities and the capacity of mm -hmm. civilian populations yeah. to understand what the security threats yeah. are work, so work. that they can yeah. see it coming. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the advantages of being able to be uh, uh, working on a dynamic continent such as Africa is that no problem is siloed to, I think, just a defense solution. Mm -hmm. And we make sure that we are trying to encompass every solution that we do to include, as I said, the drivers, economic situations, mm -hmm. governance, to ensure that our partners are um, addressing all the issues as they come their way. Mm -hmm. Maybe always. one last question. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to hear that um, U.S. takes gender issue, especially women at the heart of the policies when it comes to counterterrorism efforts. But still, you know, at, uh, on the continent level, as policymakers still up to, um, ignore the importance of women, mm. especially at higher level, peace negotiation, policy making efforts. So would you say that, um, uh, you know, pushing women um, importance from such larger scale um, counterterrorism efforts has uh, wasted an, a tool that would have helped with the global security threats? Look, I can say you could always do more. You'll never find me, uh, particularly as a woman who works in this field, um, not encouraging more women to be involved in this particular um, field um, because I think the perspective is needed. And I think 
as we continue to develop policies at the agency level, but as we continue to share information globally mm -hmm. about the importance, the need, and quite to be to be quite frank, the criticality of having women's voices mm -hmm. in these discussions, we are not going to be able to solve the world's global solutions in a way that is, I think, as comprehensive if you don't have those voices there. Different and that is, has to be a part of the solution. And the only way we can do that is if we continue to press mm -hmm. and push and ensure that women's voices are being heard to get to the solutions that the global needs. That's why we have you here today, having right. a woman like you in the position that you're in to um, inform uh, other women that you know these kind of uh, efforts are definitely needed uh, to have women in, in those places. So thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll have to stop right there. U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of, uh, of Defense for African Affairs, Chidi Blyden, thank you so much once again for joining us today in studio to discuss the need for women's participation in combating terrorism on how the U.S. Special Operation Command is making efforts to train more women on the African continent. Well, we'll be right back. Thank you. Medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see, we seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. You're watching VOA's Red Carpet. My name is Jackson Vungani. Thank you so much for joining us each week right here on Red Carpet. We bring you the latest in. You are watching our voices. We are discussing the important role of women and girls in building peace in their communities and the need for more support to include them in efforts to counter violent extremism. We are now also joined in the studio by Ms. Um, Ashley Sabarmanian Montgomery, Associate Director of Policy and Advocacy at Charity and Security Network. Ms. Uh, Sabarmanian Montgomery had an opportunity to work in few African countries like Botswana, Burundi, Nigeria, and also have been to South Sudan. And she witnessed how women are often on the front lines mediating peace, delivering aid, and supporting communities. Ms. Sabarmanian Montgomery, welcome to Our Voices. Thank you so much for having me. Such a pleasure to have you here. Yes. But before we start our discussion, let's first hear from women of the Nigerian Unconventional Security Forces to share their view on their role in the fight against terrorism in our Your Voice segment. Take a listen to Marilyn Stoker and Telema Amakri. My name is Ms. Marilyn Stoker. 
and as a trained personnel, my primary duties in my duty post is to prevent insurgents and kidnap. That is what I stand for. That is what we all stand for in this organization. And that is what we must always stand to prevent. Thank you. My name is Ms. Melin Stoker. And as a trained personnel, our primary duties is to prevent insurgents slash kidnap. That is our primary duties. That is what we stand for. And that we must stand to prevent in this society. Thank you. My name is Soe Telema Amakri. As a trained soldier of this great security organization, prevention and detention of crime is our major concern. By proactively watching and observing questionable trade oddities and insurgencies, to achieve this aim, we have been well trained to always be at alert while on duty to meet the crime and avert crisis. This we have been doing and this we shall continue to do. Thank you. Sabramanian Montgomery, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And we are discussing how women are excluded from major counterterrorism efforts. But you have been on the ground. Can you tell us how women are involved in the front line? Uh, it could be mediating peace, um, delivering aid, or, you know, pushing for peace in their communities. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm so glad that we're talking about it within the African context because uh, the continent has such a a rich history of, as you say, women on the front lines. So I want to start uh, by taking us to 2000 and thinking about the women, peace and security uh, agenda that was mentioned previously. Um, so in, in that agenda, we can really look to Namibia. Uh, Namibia at this time was a newly independent country, a young country, but they were really at the forefront of ensuring that that agenda came to life and was formalized and institutionalized. So there was uh, uh, the Wintook seminar that took place in, in May of 2000. And the, there's two outcome documents from the seminar that really um, set the preconditions and led to the passage of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which, as we know, is the um, global normative framework and the institutionalization of the women, peace, and security agenda. And it was really Namibia that was at uh, Namibia and Namibian women-led civil society that was at the forefront of enabling that agenda to come to life. Um, and uh, what Namibia also did is they looked at their history and they saw that women were not only victims, but uh, that they also played a strong role in leadership and being decision makers and preventing conflict and ending conflict. And so they were able to take that and bring it to the global stage and, and really pave a way forward. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, I know that you've worked in, in the different countries we've mentioned, including Burundi, where I'm originally from. Uh, what are some of the models that you've seen for peace um, process and, pe and bringing peace into a country that you've seen in these countries work that should be replicated in the other countries? I always ask a question like that mm. so that we, you know, we don't, we, we just don't turn any new wheels, but just use what's working. Sure. First of all, Amahoro. <laughs> Amahoro. Um, Yes, yeah, so I would say um, things that have been really effective, if maybe we can look to Liberia. Um, in, in 2003, in the Liberian Civil War, uh, women, what women led civil society and what women did in this context was they really used mass mobilization campaigns. They, um, they made themselves really, really present and, and uh, really kept growing their numbers. They positioned themselves strategically so that then President Charles Taylor had to see them every day um, and, and saw that their power and their numbers continued growing. Mm -hmm. What they also did that I think is really, really valuable across any context mm -hmm. is they built strong networks across the region. Mm. So they worked with Ghanaian women, they worked with women awesome. from Cote d'Ivoire, and they all um, together took collective action. One thing they did was um, because they weren't women were included in the formal peace processes in the track one. Mm -hmm. They did more informal, what we call track two, negotiation, mediation. Mm -hmm. um, they barricaded the room where the men were negotiating right. and they wouldn't let them leave the building wow, until yes. they came to an agreement. You're right, That's thank you so much. <laughs> so what should the international community do to help these women who are at the front lines um, and other women-led um, initiatives to counter terrorism on the continent? Yeah, that's, um, there's so much, I think, that the international community can do. Um, so number one, I, I think part of what we really need to 
do to support, especially across the African continent, is the INGO community, international um, NGOs. You know, we talk a lot about the localization agenda, the decolonization agenda, uh, but talk is one thing. To put that into action, um, they need, uh, we need to see more seeding power. So we need to see kind of uh, organizations uh, from the West in particular take a step back mm -hmm. and put those from the majority world in the front and be the leaders. You and think the, the diaspora have some type of role to play when it comes to um, countering terrorism on the continent? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the diaspora often has access to more financial resources, um, maybe different educational opportunities, just a whole host of access that they can take um, and use and share and bring back and possibly to a better understanding of what the issue is on ground as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, exactly. Maybe let's look at it from a different angle. Sure. You know, there's some of there, is a, there are criticisms on some of the counterterrorism activities on the continent, uh, especially the ones that are focused on military activities, saying they further destabilize the mm -hmm. countries, uh, fueling more yeah. um, conflict. Mm -hmm. And how does that affect women? Yeah, that's that's a really really important point. So. A lot of times when we see counterterrorism measures be over-securitized and over-militarized, mm -hmm. we see that actually in the name of countering terrorism, uh, what's happening in reality is that uh, they're creating the conditions conducive to terrorism. So mm -hmm. they're having the opposite effect of what they actually say that they want to do. And we also see when there's these big military approaches, um, it exacerbates existing gender inequalities, mm -hmm. it entrenches patriarchal norms within societies, um, which then further <laughs> exacerbate the gender inequalities. Uh, we've seen it a lot with the WPS agenda, that its, its roots were really this feminist, anti-war, anti-militarization in the beginning, um, but over time and with the passage of uh, Resolution 2242, in 2015, mm -hmm. it's become um, a much more securitized agenda. Thank awesome. you so much, Miss awesome. Ashley um, Sabarmarian Montgomery. It was a pleasure having you. That's our show for today. We'd like to thank our guests, U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs, G.D. Blyden and Ashley Sabarmanian Montgomery of Charity and Security Network for joining us today. Catch the latest episodes of Our Voices at voaafrica.com and be sure to continue the conversation on our social media platforms. We'll see you again next week with another exciting program.